Well, good morning. Kiddos, we love you. <laughs> and I'm going to send you guys out to your Bible study groups. Gary does a great job when he's hosting, doesn't he? I tell you what, um, that man blesses me. And Gary, you bless all of us. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for being a part of our team. Man, it's a joy to get to, uh, to, to speak to you this morning. And I'm going to tell you right out of the top, this is going to be a different Sunday. This is not going to be your, uh, your typical sermon. And so I hope you're, you're ready for something a little different. But I believe the Lord has something really good for us today. Before I dive in... I need to share uh, just a quick word about uh, something that's really significant that we're about to be walking into as a church. So here at the Hills, we have a special group of servant leaders who carry a unique responsibility for our church. This is a group of mature followers of Jesus that, um, is, that are raised up by God, but also identified by us as a community to provide direction for us, to provide guidance, to provide oversight and shepherding. We call them elders. You hear us talk about them often. You see them around. You have interacted with uh, the men who serve our church as elders. Sometimes we'll use the word shepherd, uh, which is a biblical analogy that is used to describe this role throughout Scripture, the role of somebody who leads God's people. And so we're beginning an important season for this campus of the Hills Church. We believe it's time to ask God to help us identify new shepherds, new elders for our church community. And so I want to share with you that we are beginning this process, uh, and we want it to be a process that is completely bathed and covered in prayer. And so the process begins today. I want to invite you to be praying but starting next Sunday, there will be a two-week window where you can make recommendations of men that you think God may be raising up to serve our church in this role. And so uh, we want to allow plenty of time for you to pray, for you to discern, for you to consider, and then time for you to also make your recommendations and I want to be clear about something. In this process, we are not so much looking for men that we can ask to step in to do something that they're not already doing, right? We are asking God to help us see men who are already shepherding people in this church and to help us identify them and raise them up into the role of elder. So again, starting next Sunday, you're going to be able to make your recommendations online, but we'll also have some physical cards and so I want to ask you to please be praying. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We would be glad to talk through this with you. Um, and in that um, vein of praying, I want to just pause and pray for this process. So we all bow with me. God, you have blessed this church richly with a history of godly leaders who love and care for this body. And Father, that's true for us today as a church, and we believe it will be true for us in the future because we depend on you. We ask for you to go before us in this process. Would you give us the eyes to see the folks among us already who are caring for this body that you may be raising up into the role of elder? Would you, uh, would you just go before us in every way, Father, in the midst of this process? In the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, for several weeks, we've been in the midst of this teaching series, U2.0. And I don't know about you, but it has been so powerful for me, what Rick has been teaching and preaching these last weeks. And as he's been, been teaching, when we surrender everything to Jesus, it's not just that he maybe dusts us off a little bit or polishes us up to make us look better. When we give everything to Jesus, he makes us new. We're not some changed version of the old. We are new creations because of Jesus. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. In Jesus, we are made brand new. You 2.0, right? And as Pastor Rick has said here at the Hills, we believe and affirm that it is possible for every single one of us to become more like Jesus and to live fully into our identities as new creations, as you 2.0. But let's be honest, in the church, sometimes we're afraid to fully acknowledge the messiness of the process that we go through being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And at times, we've been really good in the church at putting on our masks, right? You know the mask I'm talking about? It's hanging in your closet under the sign that says church mask. On Sunday when you get dressed, you, right? I think like, I remember this, learning this inadvertently as a kid, that man, we we make ourselves the best version of ourself when we come to church, acting like we have the 2.0 thing down, right? Like, but really, the truth is, We're always in process. We never fully arrive. God is continually doing his work in us, growing us and shaping us more in the image of Christ. And when we are at our best as a community is when we are real, when we are vulnerable, when we are transparent about what we are struggling with and what the Lord is doing in each one of us as he continues to make us new. When we own and acknowledge the places that he's refining and reforming, making us more like Jesus, we're all on the journey. And we will be on the journey until the day that Jesus returns and makes all things new, like they were supposed to be in the beginning. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 and 11, we just sang this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. We, friends, we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Do we believe that? So there is power in our stories, in our testimonies, because they're not about us, right? They're about the work that God is doing in us the ways that he is changing us. And so today is about embracing authenticity and transparency and sharing the power of our 1.0 to 2.0 testimonies. You're gonna hear some of my story and I'm gonna just be honest. I have been dreading this all week. (laughs) I don't want to share what I'm gonna share with you today. And I've got some other folks who've been on that journey with me as well. And I know it it is hard to admit that we're a work in progress, right? But first, I wanna wanna clear something up and make sure we, we all understand this. You don't have to make yourself into someone that Jesus loves, right? That's not our work. U2.0 isn't something that we work for or we achieve on our own because somehow God loves us more if we can just dust ourselves off a bit, right? God loves you right now. U1.0, he loves you. He created you. And yet he loves you too much to leave you where you are today. He wants so much more for you. He wants you to experience every good thing, every blessing that he has for you, every bit of the abundant life that he promises us. 
And so he's making us new. You and me. He makes us new. He does something in us when we surrender that makes us new in that moment. And yet, he also continues his work in us, making us new along the way. He makes us new and is making us new. He saves us and is saving us as we walk along the journey. We are, we are justified and adopted by God when we surrender our hearts to him. That is immediate. But transformation, as Rick said last week, takes time. It's a process. For some, the 1.0 to 2.0 transformation is drastic on the outside. Things change 180 degrees almost in a moment. We've all seen this, right? We've heard about or seen people or known people who were hopelessly addicted and they met Jesus and almost instantly it changes. He does that work. And the work of the Holy Spirit making us brand new is always miraculous. But, but sometimes the immediacy and the visibility of the change in some people makes their journey seem more miraculous than some of the work that we don't see as clearly. But in reality, it's all the miraculous work of God. It's all work that he's doing in us. Some of it is just less visible. And this is probably the reality for most of us, right? Like that God did change us immediately. We felt something change in us when we surrendered our hearts to him. And yet, our, des our desires, our behaviors didn't immediately change overnight, right? This is my story. There wasn't an, an immediate or a drastic change on the outside. I grew up in a home with parents who were committed followers of Jesus. Uh, I don't ever remember a time where we weren't connected to and invested in the church. For me, there was an expectation that I would follow Jesus. Not so much from my parents, although they made clear their desire for me was to live a life following him, but more from the church I grew up in, right? Like, because my grandfather and my dad were, were, were well-loved leaders in that church, people there just almost expected that I was going to be just like them. And that sometimes it was a little bit unfair. And I didn't like that expectation very much. And so um, I tended to push back. I tended to do things my own way. And I certainly wasn't going to surrender to Jesus because somebody else wanted me to. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that I made that decision for myself. And in all of that expectation, here's what happened. I got really, really good at playing the game. You know the game I'm talking about, right? Like I knew all of the answers to the questions. I knew the scriptures. I knew how to make everyone think I had it all together. I learned the church mask really early on. And I learned something else that would plague me for years. And I learned it at church to keep my sins and my struggles a secret. I don't think anybody intended to teach me that, but it's what I got. Scripture talks about the significance and the importance of confession. And yet, I never once experienced anything that told me church was a safe place to admit that I was struggling. Not one time. In fact, I often heard the exact opposite. Keep up appearances. Make everyone think you have it all together. And so the reality of my teenage growing up years was one of duplicity, right? I... I surrendered my life to Jesus when I was 14. And while I, I knew something was different in my life, I didn't really change much on the outside. I struggled with the same things that I had struggled with. On one hand, I was highly invested in my community. I was a leader in the student ministry I grew up in. I knew all the right things to say and do to make people see me as a follower of Jesus. 
But in other ways, my outward behavior didn't reflect the change that Jesus was making inside of me. I cared a lot about fitting in, a lot about being liked and accepted. In many days, I cared uh, more about that than I did following Jesus. I played the game really well. Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, Sunday nights back in that day. But the rest of the time, I looked a whole lot more like my friends that I spent time with away from church who weren't following Jesus. And they couldn't see anything different in me. And so I certainly did not have any influence over their lives when it came to Jesus. I was a master at keeping everyone fooled. Whoever I was with and wherever I was, I could fit into that environment just perfectly. If I was with my church friends, I'd clean up my language. I'd fit right in. And if I was with friends from school, I spoke and acted just like they did. And underlying everything during all my growing up years was an addiction to pornography. I was exposed to it when I was young middle school student on a friend's computer. And that exposure would begin a years-long habit and a battle that honestly, genuinely, at first, I didn't think was a problem. I thought it was normal and no big deal. But even once I was convicted of its destructive nature in my life, of the sinfulness of it in my life, I still, I couldn't seem to get rid of it. And once again, the skill I learned at church, keeping it all hidden at all cost, made me a master of doing whatever it took to keep my struggles in the dark. And so I played the game. And yet, even throughout that, even in the midst of addiction, I was still growing. God was still working in my life. He hadn't abandoned me. He didn't leave me to it. He hadn't given up on me. He was always continuing his work. He was making me new, even when I kept going to old, empty wells. And there were things, good things, good fruit in my life, and I could see him giving me new opportunities and experiences and there was even fruit of the Holy Spirit's work in my life. And sometimes our growth seems like two steps forward and three steps back. Can you relate to that? And I've certainly felt that many times. One of the most pivotal seasons in my journey was when my dad passed away when I was 17. He was a healthy 45-year-old man who lived with a heart defect that went undetected for 45 years and one night his heart, his brain, his lungs just filled with fluid, and that was it. He didn't wake up the next morning. And I remember coming home from the hospital that morning after he died and being so very angry. I remember picking up my Bible and throwing it against the wall in my room, and I remember yelling at God. And I remember specifically saying, God, if you really are who I've been told you are my whole life, then I need to experience you in a way that I never have before. And in my 1.0 to 2.0 journey, that's the day that, that changed everything. Whew. What the evil one intended to take advantage of, to tear me apart, I believe he wanted my destruction what he intended for that in my life, God did what only he can do. And over and over and over and over again in my life, he has turned that around for good. He has used losing my father for his glory in my life again and again and again. And that was the day I quit playing the game because I couldn't play it anymore. I didn't have the energy for it anymore. My world crumbled. And I had to just take each day as it came. 
Have you ever been in that place where all you can do is just one step at a time, one day at a time? And some days were a wreck. Other days were a little bit better. Every once in a while, I'd have a good day. But in the hardest season of my life, God did some of his best work in me. That's what he does so often, right? In the hardest days of our lives, he does his best work in us. And slowly, day by day, I began to depend on my Father in heaven. I began to see what Jesus meant when he prayed for daily bread. And when you learn to walk in step with the Holy Spirit of God in your life, you no longer need to play games. And so throughout my college years, the Lord was faithful. He continued his work in me, making me new. And even as he did his work, I continued to struggle with that addiction. Most days were okay, but there were days where I would still go to that empty well. And during my college years, God blessed me with my wife, Kendall, the most amazing godly woman I've ever known. And I remember naively thinking that, man, once we get married, that addiction will go away. But I was wrong. Though it did for a little while, but not for good. And I, I remember this day as burned in my mind. I came home from one of the jobs I was working as we were finishing school and my wife wasn't at home, but there was a letter laying on the counter with my name on it. And she told me in that letter that um, she knew what I'd been looking at on our computer and that I needed to make a decision, her or it. She wouldn't compete and I had to choose. This wasn't even a year into our marriage. And I remember her saying, I love you, not just because of the man I know you to be today, but because of the man I know that God is making you into. But I'll, I'll admit in that moment, the old instincts came flooding back. Hide. Hide make excuses, right? Rationalize, convince her it's not as big a deal as it is, right? But I'm so grateful that my wife could see the work that God was doing in me. And she was willing to journey with me. And in that mo moment, I knew it was time to do whatever it took, right? Like, and my recovery from that addiction began that day. And I'd love to say it was flawless from that day forward, but it wasn't. It was still a journey and a battle. But through daily surrender and learning to lay it down at the feet of Jesus, to lay myself down in surrender to him, to follow his example, he set me free from the bondage of that addiction and in June, Kendall and I will celebrate 20 years of marriage. And one of the things he's taught me is that he's enough. If you've been through Rooted here at the Hills, then you know one of the things that you dig into is the root lies that we tend to believe about ourselves. And some of the most important U2.0 work that God does in us is teaching us to listen only to his voice because it's all that matters. To hold on to the truth of, of what he says about us instead of believing the root lies that the evil one tries to plant deep within us. For me, it's the lie that I can never be loved or accepted that somehow I'm damaged goods, that somehow I'm defective, and so it's impossible for me to ever truly be loved or accepted. And that's the lie that's been central to my journey for so long, and I can still slip into, that, into the old patterns today and start to believe that about myself. For me, the core of my 1.0 to 2.0 transformation 
has been learning to call this lie for what it is and to live in the truth of my identity as a son of the king, accepted and loved by my creator. Amen. It's why pornography grabbed a hold of me the way it did. Right? Like, it would never reject me. It was always there. But it was an empty well. And so I stand here today as one of your pastors, not a man whose journey has been flawless, but who some, or somehow I have it all figured out. I don't. The only thing I have figured out is that I have a desperate need for Jesus. I need him to save me. I need him to make me new. I need him to continue his work in me every single day. I need him to make me into the man that God created me to be. And if you've been around this place for very long, then I hope, I hope, I pray that you've seen in me a man who is real and honest about the journey. It's not easy, but it is so worth it. Every day that I wake up with breath in my lungs, I surrender my heart to Jesus again. And I trust him to do the work that only he can do in me that day. Make me a little bit more like Jesus. And I'm so incredibly grateful that I am not the man I once was. I'm made new. A new creation by the grace of God. And you can be too. So I want to invite out two brothers uh, who are going to come out and join me on stage. Scott Kemper and Brandon Baines. Y'all welcome Scott and Brandon. How we doing, guys? Excellent. Good. Thank you all for joining me. Have, have you guys been dreading this like I've been dreading it all week? Like, oh, man, am I really going to do this? I love to talk, so we'll be here for a while, I guess. <laughs> so you're good, huh? So y'all tell us, um, tell us a little bit about you um, briefly. So my name's Brandon. I've um, been here about five, six years. I'm a lawyer. I'm sorry. Um, I've got three kids, 14, 12, and 10. Mm. Thanks for being with us today. Scott? Yeah. Hey, guys. My name's Scott, and I uh, have... Um, been on staff here for four years, um, have a 12-year-old daughter, nine-year-old son, my wife Gabby, and uh, yeah, man, just blessed yeah. to be part of this place. So a couple years ago, I interviewed Scott in a setting like this, and he shared some of his story, so you may have heard some of that before, uh, but would you guys, Scott, maybe you start, and then Brandon, tell us a little bit about the 1.0 sure. you. Sure, man, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, um, the thing in my life... Um, was that I felt called to ministry, uh, but at the same time, um, as you go through life, I began, uh, you, you pick up baggage sometimes, and part of that baggage for me uh, became my dependence and my need upon alcohol, and, um, and it, was a, it became a daily thing. It was a thing that I absolutely had to have that I put above everything else in my life, uh, my family, my marriage, my everything, my ministry, my, my walk. And, uh, and, you know, I had tried so many times uh, in so many ways through blood, sweat, and tears to find a way out, you know, and I just couldn't. And honestly, I, what happened in my life was probably what uh, Satan wants, and that is I just said, I guess I'm just going to be this way. I guess I'm just going to be broken. I'm defective. I don't know. Maybe God's grace uh, doesn't apply to me like it says in the Bible. And I just, I, I began believing that lie, you know, and I operated that way. I'm just going to hide in shame and, uh, and just hide it and uh, just, I guess I have to live this way, you yeah. know, and, and yeah. uh, it, was, it was rough, man. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Brandon? I mean, a, lo a lot of the same. I, I was a, a drunk for 20 years. Um, I, I used to say that I didn't start drinking until I was 22, but I made up for it mm. uh, over the next 20 years. I had three basic life status. I was either hungover and feeling terrible, I was planning on getting drunk, or I was drunk. Mm. And that was the only three. I was selfish. Um, you know, I've driven drunk with my kids and family more times than I could even count. Yeah. Totaled my car, 
Um, I, I think I say, but for the grace of God, I didn't lose my life, my family, my job. Um, full of shame, full of guilt, saying maybe tomorrow will be different. Um, but it, it wasn't. It was always this prison of, I remember vividly waking up one morning. I wasn't even awake. My eyes were still closed. And my first thought was, I feel horrible from the night before. What did I do? What did I say? Who do I need to apologize to? My second thought before I opened my eyes was, when can I start drinking again? Mm -hmm. And maybe if we plan a party, I can start drinking a little bit earlier because mm -hmm. that'll give me some cover or maybe I'll cook a nice dinner. But it was that cycle mm -hmm. over and over again, it just caught in that prison of, of alcoholism. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about how, how, how did Jesus get your attention? Like, how, what, what was the turning point? Go, either one of you. For me, it was, um, it was just the realization that my marriage was falling apart. I uh, was not the husband I needed to be. Uh, my wife was tired of living with half a man, you know. Uh, half the time I was um, in recovery from the night before, the day before, and then, uh, and it just was, it came to head where it was like, you need to figure this out because I'm not going to live this way and our kids aren't going to live this way. Yeah. So, yeah. So for me, um, you know, you mentioned earlier this, this testimony that you did with Scott and again, for years and years and years, I was battling this and I would try and tell myself, you can do this. You can just white knuckle it. Um, you know, I, I have a story I told you. I woke up in a city, I think it was Philadelphia. I'd stayed up till 4, 5 a.m. drinking in my hotel room. And I looked up an, an Alcoholics Anonymous class, and I thought, I'm going to go to AA, but I don't want to go in the city where I live. I want to go somewhere yeah. else so my wife won't find out. And I couldn't bring myself to do it because I thought, I'm going to have to say, my name is Brandon, I'm an alcoholic. So I didn't go. So I lived like that for years and years. And we had this deal where Scott came out here it was the only time I'd ever seen any format like that. And I remember exactly where I was sitting. I can see she has a flower dress on. I don't know who <laughs> she is, but I can see her. There she is. I was sitting right there. And Scott was up here talking. And that way, on the way to church that morning, I was having all these thoughts about this life that I'm leading, and I can't get out of it. And just I was having a mental conversation with myself. And this is the part where y'all are, somebody out there is going to be like, this guy's crazy. And I know you're <laughs> going to do it because I would be that guy saying, that guy's crazy. Yeah. But Scott was sitting up here and he started talking. And church, he wasn't saying the same kind of concepts or the same general feeling. He was saying the exact same words that were going through my head that morning. And I know that sounds insane. But it was the same words, and it was like this road to Damascus moment where my body mm. reacted. My pores, I felt them open. I started sweating. My heart jumped. I just, I could not imagine that somebody was feeling the exact same way that I felt. And I came up to him afterwards and introduced my, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that, uh, but introduced myself, and then that led me on a path of sobriety. Yeah, amen, amen. So how long? Uh, it's been, uh, be nine years, yeah, amen. in October. Amen, amen. amen. <laughs> how about you? Uh, 825 days today. Amen. So thank amen. you. Amen. So I, I specifically asked these two men because we believe in the power of story, we believe in the power of vulnerability, and this is a picture of it. Scott and I, I remember us both that morning wrestling and praying together, like, Lord, I'm gonna put myself out there, this is gonna be hard. Would you do what only you can do? And we knew there was a Brandon in the crowd, and God did what only he can do. Amen. And it's a beautiful thing. So uh, let, let's thank these men one more time. Thank you for sharing with us. Grateful for both of you.
So let me pray, church. Father, we honor you. These are your stories. They're your stories that you're writing in your people, not for our glory, but for your glory, Father. And so we say thank you. We know we need you. Desperately, we need you, Father. And so we just ask you'd continue your work in us. Wherever we are today, God, we know you don't leave us there. You meet us there. And you give us a way forward. And so today, we offer ourselves to you, Father. Would you write your story in us? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for the way you love us. Thank you for the way you never give up on us. It's in your mighty and powerful name that I pray. Amen. Well, church, I wonder, what is your 1.0 to 2.0 story? Maybe you feel stuck. Maybe you don't know. But here's what I know. He's writing one in you. And so we're going to take a few minutes and you're going to get to hear some more stories from people in this church that God is writing. I wonder for you, will you see a part of your story in someone else? I hope so. And I hope we'll respond as how, how the Lord moves us today. So, here's my story. I know who you are. The cross of salvation was only the start. Now I am chosen, free and forgiven. I have a future. And it's worth living Cause I was made to be Tending a grave I was called by name Born and raised back to life again I was made for more So why would I make Bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way. I know I am yours, and I was made for more. Cause I know who I am. Cause I know who you are. Cross the salvation.
Why would I make a bed in my 